Ko Daniela Roach uh, Aho. I'm Daniela Roach, and I get the joy of opening God's Word tonight. Uh, and I'm really excited about what we get to learn. So I hope you are too. So strap in, get ready to go. We've got some awesome things to learn tonight. And, and we're still in the book of John, if you've been tracking with us, and particularly John chapter 17. Uh, and tonight we're looking at verses 13 to 19. But before we launch in, hands up if you've been following the America's Cup. Oh, not many sailing. I see one or two. Well, look around. Of course, Cam Wright's been following the America's Cup. Look around for the other hands because they're the people for you to talk to about it and definitely not me because I am not a sailing fan at all. My sailing career started and ended on the same day, on a stormy day back in 2007. Um, I was in year eight and my school put up this flyer for this have a go at sailing day. And being the kind of gung-ho, high achiever that I was, I thought, oh, I could add sailing to my, uh, my list of things that I can do. So I talked to my friend Deborah and we agreed. We would go to the have a go at sailing day and we turned up with our wetsuits and they provided us with the life jackets. And the first half of the day was dedicated to the theory of sailing, which makes sense, right? Uh, we were learning from scratch, and so they taught us, I couldn't even tell you what they taught us, but some stuff about sailing. Um, and then it was the afternoon was dedicated to actually doing the sailing. So the morning was the kind of theory lessons about what to do with the ropes and the thingy-majigs. And then the afternoon we were actually getting to get out on the water, and it was stormy, it was windy, you know, not prime conditions, I don't think. Um, I actually don't know, uh, maybe it was. Uh, anyway. The time came for the afternoon, and that really was all we were looking forward to. Uh, and so we get in our pairs, I'm with my friend Deborah, and we get in the little, is it an Optima? Is that the little boat? Give me a nod can, is that right? Yep, there we go. Get in our boat, and, and off we go, ready to go. Uh, but we get in the boat, and we soon realize that we either weren't listening, or we've completely forgotten what we just got taught, because we have no idea what we're doing, and the wind has picked up, and we just, somehow the boat just is facing away from the shore and we're just going in a straight line very quickly, very far away from the shore. And we knew, we're like, okay, you've been taught how to turn around, you've been taught how to turn around, but we completely drew a blank. And so we had to decide what we were going to do in that moment. And you've got two 12-year-old girls trying to come up with a solution. And do you know what our solution was? We literally jumped out of the boat Abort, abort, abort. So we jump out, me on this side, Deborah on that side, because we've got our life jackets that'll keep us afloat, and off the boat goes, on its own, still going right out into the water. And I can hear the instructor on the shore yelling, what are you doing? Uh, and I mean, we just, we just were in self-preservation mode. And so he gets in the dinghy and turns on the little engine on the dinghy, goes out, harnesses the boat somehow, brings it back into shore, and needless to say, my sailing career ended that day. Um, like I said before, we're studying the chapters of John, and I will come back to the sailing story later. Um, but where we're at at the moment in chapter 17 is, is Jesus has just started to pray. And last week, Jamie talked us through um, this, the first half of Jesus's prayer for his disciples. And, and it's in this first half we heard that Jesus is praying and asking God to protect his disciples. And tonight's passage looks at that second half of Jesus's prayer for his disciples. And it's a continuation and an elaboration on part one of that prayer for the disciples. And what we see is that Jesus again asks God to protect his disciples. And this time he specifies who or what he wants to he prays for them to be protected from, but he also asks God to do one more thing for his disciples. He asks God to sanctify them. This passage we're looking at tonight is where that classic Christian phrase, be in the world but not of the world, comes from. And I think sometimes we mistake that little phrase as actually being a scriptural phrase, and it's it is definitely informed by Scripture, but it's actually, there's a lot more to it. And Jesus actually has a lot more to say about why that's how we're called to live. And tonight, my prayer and my heart is that we, we see that. 
And my, my prayer is that we see that this prayer, that Jesus is praying for his disciples, we will see that he continues to pray that over us today. In Aotearoa, in 2021, Jesus continues to pray for our protection and for our sanctification. So can I just have the first slide up? Can I ask you to etu, stand as we read this little passage, and then I'll pray. So John chapter thir- uh, 17, verse 13 to 19. This is Jesus praying to God. He says, I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And for them, I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Will you bow your heads with me as I pray? God, I thank you for your word. And I thank you that tonight we get the precious opportunity to learn from your very words, Jesus, your very prayer to your own Father. I pray that anything that's not of you falls away over the next 20 minutes, that your Holy Spirit will be present here, will be moving here, will be uh, tapping on people, revealing your truth and revealing the challenge you have. God, I thank you that these words uh, don't actually require much more teaching. They're powerful as they are, but I pray that you, um, yeah, you, you help me to teach this tonight. Amen. Uh, so in verse 14, uh, the first part, uh, he says, I've given them your word. And the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. And all throughout Jesus' ministry, Jesus was teaching his disciples. He was equipping his disciples. He was giving them what the original Greek word uh, calls the logos, the word that Jesus received from God. And, and this word logos, it, has the, it means... Um, a concept or an idea that comes from a spoken voice. It's the saying and the word and the teaching of God the Father. And that's what Jesus was on earth to do. He was on earth to give the word of God. And in the somewhat difficult to understand concept, Jesus himself was also described as the word, as the logos. And so in in the book of John in particular, he describes Jesus as the word in the first few verses of John. And this is to show that idea that Jamie taught us about last week about uh, the, the, the Trinity, God, Son, uh, Holy Spirit, three in one. Jesus was the word of God sent into the world to teach the people. And in, in giving them God's word, both through himself, Jesus, and through his teachings, Jesus was preparing his disciples to be able to live on in the world when he had said, see you later, when he had gone. He was preparing them to be so fully equipped to live out the gospel, the good news, even in his physical absence. But we read here that in giving the disciples God's word, it led to the world hating them. Now, I don't know about you, but I was raised being told that the word hate is a very strong word. And I was often told off for using it. Anyone else the same? Yeah, it was quite a common thing. You just, you don't use the H word. But here Jesus is throwing around the H word just like all the time. So when I was reading this, I thought maybe the translation, because obviously we're reading it in a translated language, I thought maybe the translation got a bit mucked up and that maybe the original was actually more like disliked or um, the world found them kind of annoying 
Maybe that was actually the original meaning. But as I actually looked into the original word that's used for this word hate, uh, missio, it means to pursue with hatred and to detest. So I soon realized actually Jesus is using this word intentionally and it's a pretty strong word, right? And it's not the first time he's gone there and he's not the first time he's shared this idea about the world hating the disciples. If we turn to the next slide, we see in John 15 verse 18, he says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. And then the next verse, if you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. He's touched on this before. And what does he mean by the world, right? Like I read this and I go, wow, that's quite heavy. Uh, I don't know if I want to sign up for hatred from the world, Jesus. And, and this, world, this word world is this word cosmos, and it's referring to the system of human existence that was fully anti and hostile toward God. A world lost in sin. A world wholly at odds with anything of God. A world that's, been, that's ruined and depraved of the things of God. It's the devil's territory he's touching on. That is what hated and hates the disciples. And while it's strong language, Jesus wasn't wrong. Do you know all of Jesus' disciples except John were martyred for their faith? They tried to martyr John too, um, but he miraculously survived. The disciples were hated. Jesus got this right. And we can take from this verse that there's a, there's a link between the world's hatred and the word of God, that the disciples' receipt of the word of God explains why they suffered hatred. And so why? What, what is it about the word of God? What's so amazing or uh, special about the word of God that the whole world hated anyone who received it? It's because the word of God is this, that Jesus Christ in coming to this earth and in being the sacrifice for all of our sin, he called out sin. He called out pride. He called out judgment and hypocrisy and religious activity. His gospel was radical because it required people to radically change the way they'd been living. It required people to be prepared to let go of controlling their own lives. And, and it required people to get off the, their own throne. People didn't like that. We still don't. We don't like being told what to do, do we? And I think that's what Jesus is getting at here when he says, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. Jesus is saying that when the word of God is received and believed by a person, it changes them. And by changing them, it changes their citizenship. We, like Jesus, we're no longer citizens of this world. We are citizens of heaven. And in, this, is, this translates in how we live our lives on earth as well. And there's just two important things I want to pick up, at this, pick up on, on at this point. And the first is I think there's a trap we can fall into as Christians when we read this verse. Where we, we misinterpret it as an excuse for self-righteousness. I think it's too common for Christians to almost see and, and declare their separateness from the world as though it makes them better than non-believers. And that's just not the case. Our salvation doesn't make us better. It just means that we've acknowledged how broken we are and how in need of a saviour we are. We often, I think, can get that wrong. And the second thing is that Jesus is comparing the disciples with himself when he says, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. He's saying, I'm like you and you're like me. And he, this means he is the blueprint. He is the model of what living a not of the world life looks like. 
And I don't know about you, but when I read my Bible and I look at the life of Jesus, I see a person who had time and grace for people in the bad books of society and people who had been shunned. I see a person who didn't tolerate things like racism and cultural divide and segregation. I see a person who was prepared to call out hypocrisy and hierarchy and judgmental attitudes. I see a person who was empathetic and compassionate to people who needed empathy and compassion. You see, Jesus is the example of what a not of this world life looks like. Jesus is the example. If you used the life of Jesus as a mirror against your life, what would be staring back at you? It's a hard question, right? What I love about the next part of Jesus' prayer for the disciples is that even though he's just made clear that they aren't part of the world, he makes it equally clear that he doesn't mean they should be absent from the world or scared of it. And it's as though Jesus is saying to God, his father, just so we're clear, Dad, I'm not asking you to remove them from the world, even though you could. That's not what I'm asking. And I find it interesting as I was reading this, I was remembering what Jamie was teaching about last week, about how the Trinity and three and one and how God and the God and Jesus are one. And so it made me think, surely God knows that, right? Like, why does Jesus have to put this in there? And I think it's for our benefit to remind us that his plan is not to remove us from the world. Because I wonder if he knew we'd be tempted to approach life like that. In the same way I took to the sailing boat course, abort, 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 Get out, don't know what I'm doing, too scary. I'm out. I wonder if Jesus knew that that could be a tendency. So he makes it really clear, that's not the plan. In fact, Jesus prays the very opposite and we see in the next slide, he says, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. In the same way that God sent Christ into the world with a particular purpose, Jesus sent out his disciples with a particular purpose, which was to share the love and grace of Jesus Christ with everyone around them. And how could they possibly do that if they were hidden away in holy huddles, separate and disconnected from the world around them? They couldn't, which is why Jesus makes it clear here that they've been designed to be sent But Jesus did know the nature and reality of the world, that it's messy, that it's dark, that it's hard, that it's evil. He knew that the world would oppose the message of Christ. He knew it wouldn't be easy. He knew it would be challenging. So so what does Jesus do knowing all of that and having said everything he said, what does he do? What's his plan for this tension between his purpose of sending the disciples and the challenges that being sent would mean? He again asks God to protect the disciples. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Note here that he doesn't say, my prayer is that they figure out how to protect themselves. He prays that God would protect his disciples because he knew the power of the protection of the Father. And I believe Jesus continues to pray that over us today. He prays for our protection as his children, his followers here on earth. You know, my little sailing boat, it was designed to be out on the water. Like its purpose would have been wasted if it just sat at the dock. So it was called the dock. And I wouldn't have learned how to sail in real life, not that I did. But the only way I would have learned is actually being out on the water, right? Doing what the boat's supposed to do. And in the same way that my sailing boat was designed to be out on the water, we, as followers of Jesus, we have been designed to be out in the world. Our purpose is just wasted if we hide away 
sitting at the dock. But we still need to know how to sail, how to actually navigate and control the boat in order to stay safe. You see, while a sailing boat is designed to be out on the water, it is not designed to have the water get into the boat. Do you see the distinction? Because if a boat gets a leak or it starts to fill, what happens? It starts to sink. Sailing ships don't make very successful submarines. (laughs) And I think the same goes for us, right? And I, I think some of us, maybe like year eight me in my little Optima boat, have forgotten how to turn around. And as I was sitting yesterday, I was sitting out at Tioka Bay down in the Banks Peninsula. What a beautiful part of New Zealand. And I was looking out at the vast ocean. And I just couldn't get this thought out of my head that for whatever reason, it's as though we've become blurry on the word of God, on the instructions we've received through the Bible, through the Holy Spirit. We've lost track of what we've been instructed to do. Or maybe we actually, if we're honest, never really paid attention in the first place. But we've found ourselves as a result out in the water, heading toward uncharted territory, not knowing what to do, not knowing what move to make. And I think in this situation, we can take one of two options and neither of which are the right one. One, we tap out, we jump out of the boat, we do a Danny and we say, see you later. Or the second is that we just decide, you know what, who cares? Off we go, in we go, into the depths. And we start to get a bit lost. You know, God is the ultimate just forgotten the word. Captain, that's what I was looking for. He knows how to navigate better than we ever will. And I think we've got such a, maybe we've gripped onto the steering wheel too tight. And it's time to actually realize that we've got the balance wrong. We're on one hand, maybe we're so focused on the not being of the world side of things, that we've forgotten we are still meant to be in the world. Or on the other hand, we're so focused on the fact we're supposed to be in the world that we've forgotten that Jesus is very clear we're not supposed to be of the world. I think Jesus has guidance for us tonight to reorientate, to reroute, and to remind us how to turn around out of waters that aren't safe for us. But we weren't actually designed to sail in. There's one more part of this prayer I just want to touch on tonight. And that's Jesus' final request in this prayer for his disciples. So he's prayed for protection. He's prayed for them to be unified. He's prayed for them to have joy. And now he prays for their sanctification. We just get, here we go. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. Now, that word sanctify, it's not everyday chit chat, is it? We don't use it in common conversation. Um, But it has this meaning of being made holy, being made pure being set apart. And what I love about how Jesus prays in this moment is that he prays that we would be sanctified by God's word. Again, he doesn't pray that we would sanctify ourselves. And he doesn't pray that because that's impossible It's actually impossible to self-sanctify. The process of sanctification, of becoming set apart, is a complete work of God in us and through us that can only be achieved as we receive and learn from His Word, His Logos. 
Sure, we have to allow him to do it. We still play a part in it. Don't get me wrong. We have autonomy in this process. You know, we, we have a role, as with any relationship, to listen, to allow space, to give opportunity to the Holy Spirit to speak and nudge and say, oh, what are, what are you doing? You know, we have a role in asking God for his wisdom. How do you want me to live? How do you want me to choose in this situation? What do you have for me, God? That's our role for sure. But the minute we start to think that we can sanctify ourselves through self-righteousness and good behavior and isolation from the nasty, messy, dark world, we've missed the point completely. We're just sitting at the dock. Sanctification only comes from God and it's intended for the purpose of us being sent. We're not just sanctified to sit there looking pretty. We're sanctified to be sent to share Jesus with the world. Can I just ask the band to come on up? Um, this final verse, verse 19, I... Oh, this one here, for them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. I'll just remind you of this context of this prayer. Remember, Jesus has just had his last supper with his disciples, and he's just about to finish this prayer, and the very next thing that happens, he goes to the garden of Gethsemane, and there he's arrested, and he's, he's taken away, and he's crucified. And you see, it's the cross that achieves that true sanctification. See, he says that they may be truly sanctified. He's giving a spoiler alert, I think, of the fact that our sanctification is only ever complete and possible when we accept the work of Jesus on the cross. His sacrifice for us, you see, sanctification doesn't come from striving or seclusion, it comes from sacrifice. The sacrifice of a perfect savior who modeled for us wonderfully how we're meant to live in this crazy old world. And do you know that if you follow Jesus today, if you're a Jesus follower, you are a disciple of Jesus, he is praying the same prayer over you today. I really believe that. Like I believe he continues to sit at the right hand of the Father and pray for us. He's praying, protect them. He's praying, sanctify them. Will you let yourself be covered by that prayer tonight and actually receive that prayer and live in alignment and in accordance with what he's praying over you? Now, maybe for some of you, this is all new. <laughs> You're like, what is she harping on about? What is this gospel? What is sanctification? I am a bit lost. But if I'm gonna use the, continue the metaphor, maybe you've been captaining the ship of your own life up until this point. You've been trying to navigate on your own. You know, Jesus is the best captain you'll ever find. And like I said before, he knows the ropes better than anyone, better than you, better than me better than any pastor or top theologian. Jesus is the captain that you need to guide you through these crazy waters that we find ourselves in. Can I ask you tonight, if, if you wanna have a, a conversation about what it might look like to actually invite Jesus in to, to do that for you, please come and have a chat so that we can introduce you and, and connect you with life with Jesus best decision you'll ever make. But maybe some of you, you're realizing that you, um, you need a bit of rerouting. <laughs> that this, the challenge of being in the world but not of the world has become, um, it's at home again tonight. You know, that's not just a little Christianese phrase that you learned at youth group. <laughs> it's, it's wisdom and it's God's design for you, it's God's design for me. So if that's the case, we're gonna sing a few songs. And we're gonna take a moment to worship and thank Jesus for the fact that he 
how he sanctifies us. We'll take communion. Natasha will lead us through that shortly. So that's how we're gonna spend the next 10 or so minutes. But if you've got that little like, oh, come forward and someone would love to stand with you. Pray with you if you'd like prayer, but maybe you just want someone to stand with you or maybe you just need to take some time on your own to reorientate yourself, to realise that you've been zooming into uncharted waters at far too fast a speed and that you actually really need God to reroute you tonight back in the right direction. Maybe some waters started to get in because you've been spending too much time in the water type thing, you know? Maybe it started to come up over the edges and you're like, you know, Jesus has so much grace and love for you to help you through that and to set you on the right course again so that we can be sent and be effective in sharing Him in our whanau, in our family, in our friends, in our workplaces, in our unis, so that we get the balance right, so that we get the balance right. And I think, um, I think we can all be open to how God wants to prompt us on that tonight. So can I please invite you to Etu, stand. Uh, I'd love to pray uh, and then we worship. Uh, but yeah, like I say, please come forward if anything tonight uh, has, has just resonated in your spirit. Father God, I thank you that you don't leave us to figure it out on our own, <laughs> that you, um, you're so clear in your wisdom and your guidance and your design for us. And I just pray that you give us the humility tonight to come under your leadership, to come under your wisdom, to come under your word, God, to realign ourselves with you that our lives may be effective in spreading your gospel, God. We ask your Holy Spirit right now to fall afresh. And I, I borrow your words, Jesus, as I close, and I pray protection and I pray sanctification. I thank you, those are beautiful things and that you're praying that over us daily. May we remember that always. I pray in your precious name, Jesus. Amen.